welcome back we are all set to start a, a new the new module on nuclear medicine right so as per uh, our flow of contents right we will start nuclear medicine with first talking about the physics part of it a quick overview and then physics and then the different uh, you know sub modalities the nuclear medicine is one big branch within that what are the different uh, uh, techniques that are used to acquire right so different images that you can get so we'll go in that order so uh, what we'll do first is uh, start with overview and then physics spend some time on planar scintigraphy it's like very and then on your tees very similar to the template that we followed right x ray imaging so physics we covered then projection radiography after projection radiography we started to talk about the tomography part of it right so uh, similar order we will cover here and then conclude with image quality considerations for pet and uh, pet okay so uh, let's get ourselves introduced to nucleid imaging right in fact we introduced this in some sense during our introduction so it's going to be a quick overview of what it is so what is nuclear medicine i mean nuclear medicine might seem like it's medical sub speciality right that's how it is um, used nuclear medicine we are engineers so why, why is it nuclear medicine i mean traditionally that's how it has been housed but our interest we want to look at it from a, a nucleid also known as nucleid imaging so what is nucleid imaging the name is very suggestive right imaging of the nucleus so what we did so far we will again review that but uh, we were talking about in x ray in the earlier modules about x ray we were more interested about the electrons right now we should be more interested in the nuclear aspect of it right of the atom so quickly this is the logic so you hear what is happening is we actually send some radio traces radio activity all these terms we will kind of describe uh, uh, in this module to begin with but essentially you are you are taking some you are sending some radio activity into the body in the form of radio traces after that what happens is you give it some time it will distribute itself right so you introduce radio activity into the body that substance will distribute because you put it in the blood it will go through wherever the blood is taking it and get used right or get accumulated or go to location where it is used right so, and then because this is radioactive tracer it is going to give out radioactivity or it is going to give out gamma energy so it is going to give out gamma energy so when we detect this gamma energy our interest here is not in the energy per se our interest is after you detect the gamma where is it coming from right that is our interest so you give some time right for uptake metabolism to happen after that you detect you detect the regional variation of this activity right and the idea is the presence of absence of any activity can be tracked by the variation in the uptake right so detect regional variations of radioactivity as an indication of presence or of absence of a physiological function so the key message here is even before we said x ray x ray came out on the other side and we detected and we said oh depending on the attenuation we could tell what is that depending on the number of photons that are received right on the detector we used to tell what is the attenuation along the path so it was a distribution of mu in x ray energy here on the other hand we are not really interested in the attenuation of the or or what is the mu or anything here the activity is coming our objective is to say where that activity came from because that activity is indicative of some action so it this is functional imaging this is the key so this is very important functional imaging so whatever we did in x ray it was through transmission you sent through got the energy on the x ray energy on the other side whereas here as you can see in this diagram here the 
the, the source is sent into the body, right? Source is sent into the body, your objective is to detect where the source is. So, based on the detection, you have to locate where the source is. So, it is slightly different way of looking at things. But it gives very powerful look, for example, so you have some instrumentation which we will cover and then you transform this to an image. Notice here, right, there is a region that is high activity. Say for if you have a tumor, right, a cancerous tumor, you know cancers tend to grow aggressively. So, they, they are metabolically more active. So, when you send a, 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 a radioactive tracer, it will go accumulate more, right, in the region where there is more metabolic activity. So, the radioactivity will come from more from this location because the radio tracer that you sent is supposed to uh, go there, okay. So, you engineer it so that it, it, it goes to that location, okay. Uh, good, so we will go into all these terms that I said, right, radioactivity, tracer, uh, giving out energy, gamma rays, detector, all this we will cover, okay, but this is the rough idea that we want to know. So, once this gamma rays come, we can either use gamma camera or a detector array. So, how we did for uh, chest X for projection radiography, right? We got an X-ray imaging, we got an image or in, in CT, X-ray CT, we detected it and then did a reconstruction. So, we will do similar things here. In one we call as a scintigraphy, the other is your PET or SPECT depending on what you are uh, reconstructing, okay. So, um, so much for the introduction of what we are, it is a big picture overview of what we are going to cover. So, just to uh, relate it to what we have covered so far or what you know from uh, X-ray CT, right, where are the difference? So, in projection radiography, right, what we covered, we covered projection radiography and tomography. So, that was a through transmission image, that is the key, okay. And most of the time, what the images that we showed, right, it was structural imaging or measure, measuring the anatomical structure, okay. Whereas, in nuclear medicine, as we just saw, this is about detecting the gamma rays, but this is from inside, emitting from the source inside the body. So, this is a emission imaging, okay. It is not through transmission, this is emission. So, you, you, you send the radio tracer, radioactive tracer into the body and it starts to emit gamma rays. So, you are essentially catching the emissions. So, it is called as where is the emission coming from? How much of emission is coming from where? That is what you are capturing. So, it is your emission imaging. Again, like we talked about, it is a functional. So, you are not really talking about anatomical contrast here you are not actually trying to measure the tumor dimension, right. You are trying to capture or you are trying to see the tumor based on the activity that is happening. So, you are not going to measure the tumor size based on this image. For that, we can use CT. We are going to catch the activity of the tumor that you can use PET. How metabolically active is the tumor that you can catch from PET. Okay. So, it is actually, so there are several other applications, brain perfusion, myocardial perfusion, this is another important, so, uh, you know, whole body, in, in one of the introduction slides we showed PET, you can use it for whole body, right. So, you can actually detect where all the activity is, it will light up in the body. So, it is a very good uh, modality to capture or see the metastasis, meaning a primary tumor is there and it goes branches out, tumors come in different locations. So, you can do a whole body PET scan, you might find out possible locations where that cancer is active, okay. So, it, by itself, it is a functional image, anatomy is not the main interest. So, usually what happens? So, this is an example of a PET images and the color scheme that it is usually plotted. So, uh, you, you can notice that, uh, of course, Bladder will show up, anything that you take, it is going to come to the bladder, right. So, you can always catch up in the bladder. But the key difference here is, this is the corresponding attenuation image or from your CT. 
notice you see so much details here which is actually not present here so typically you also call what we call as a pet ct right so they fuse these two images it's a multimodal imaging here it's dual mode pet and ct scanner so pet ct scanner uh, uh, essentially tries to register the pet on top of a ct so that you get both structural image and functional aspect of it so this is very powerful clearly you can appreciate this image gives you lot more information than either of the two images in isolation okay so it has a very uh, uh, powerful uh, you know very clinically significant uh, applications and so what we will try to do now is step in and understand what is the physics that the first part that we said right here we understood attenuation that forms the basis for the uh, the image the pixel if you see right where does it come from what is the meaning of the pixel what are the units of the pixel all that we covered right hopefully you are able to appreciate that so we'll try to now do the same thing when you see a red color or a yellow color or bright yellow what does it mean what are the units of that how did we get it what all does it capture how all it got how can i increase it decrease it right what plays a role in that so all these aspects both from physics fundamental physics and then the instrumentation and imaging and image quality we will cover for uh, of course this is pet we will cover for nuclear medicine this is only one of the more, you know one of the techniques in nuclear medicine okay fine so what we will do now is get to the same slide that we started with right with the atomic structure what you notice is uh, this is the same slide what we were focusing on in the previous module with x ray we talked about only the electrons and how the energy x energy x ray energy interacts with these electrons but now the focus is going to shift to the center okay so we are going to now talk about the nucleus part what is what is there oh you have protons and neutrons you have protons and neutrons so now we need to address the similar question okay we also talked about stable nuclides right of course we'll pay now attention to this approximately equal to that is one take home message you will you will get across but there is a relationship between neutrons and protons for the nuclei to be stable okay so if under certain conditions you can have unstable nuclides so if a nuclide is unstable that atom is called as radio nuclides radioactive atoms okay so what is the big deal about this oh the big deal is something is stable we we talked about this also for the uh, whole of electrons interactions right if something is unstable the nature has it that it will it will come back to stability by sending out the excess energy right this is a big picture philosophy right you have to give out the energy to come back to ground state which is usually the more stable state so likely to undergo radioactive de decay right so the radioactive element radioactive atom sends out the extra energy comes back to ground state okay so we will see what kind of atoms of course we talked about unstable nucleides give rise to radioactive atom so uh, we will see the conditions under which this happens or some of the radioactive uh, atoms and elements and how it can be engineered we will look at it so before we jump in there are several different terminologies small variations in the number game right so what is an isotope you have the same mass number sorry uh, you have the same uh, atomic number but different mass number so here for example right you have carbon 12 or carbon 11 carbon is the same element so chemically identical okay so these are called isotopes but uh, you could also have what is called as isobars oh it's here is the thing right so atoms with the same mass number but different atomic number 
right. So, if it is a different atomic number, we also have, we said this, right, uh, uh, redundant information. So, now boron, carbon, we also named it. So, carbon, boron, these are different elements, but they have same mass number. So, these are called isobars. There are a few more isos that we will cover, okay. So, isotones. So, we were even talking about mass number, sorry, electrons and protons, right? Electrons, protons or new, uh, your, your nucleus, right? Um, but in the nucleus, we start to have protons and neutrons. Isotones, what happens? Oh, isotones have same number of neutrons, but have different A, right? Mass number. So, within the neutrons, right, within the nucleus, you have neutrons and protons. Here is a case where isotones, atoms with the same number of neutrons, but it has a different mass number. Isomers, oh, this is another interesting aspect. Isomers, it has same everything, same Z and A, but it is at a different energy level, okay. So, these are you know, these are interesting because these are sometimes used in the process that we are going to look at, right. So, sometimes these come out because of the decay process, okay. So, there are several isos that you should be very familiar. It is slightly confusing, but then uh, you, when you look at the context and see how it is exploited, I think it will become, you, you should be able to uh, get over that confusion, okay. Um, okay, so, so much for the different types. So, now what we need to talk about is, okay, we have radioactivity. So, you have unstable nucleides, it has to shed energy to become stable. So, this process, right, you have some radioactivity. So, we need to define why is this is happening or where, where all this, this, uh, this energy, right, the excess energy to shed, where is it coming from, right. We talked about similar thing, binding energy when we talked about in electrons, right, electron binding energy. Now, our interest is in the nucleus. So, we need to talk about two concepts. One is mass defect, the next is its equivalent, binding energy of uh, the constituents of the nucleus. So, what is mass, the mass of an atom, right? Oh, we know mass of all these, right? Uh, have you heard of atomic mass unit? Right, you would have heard about that, right? So, it is one twelfth of the, the carbon, carbon 12, right? That is what we use as a units for talking about the mass. But it turns out that, oh, you have a mass, but then I have the constituents, right? Which are electrons, protons and neutrons each of these particles have a mass. So, what happens if I sum the masses of the constituents of the atoms, right? Atom consists of these components, right? These constituent elements, particles. So, if I add them, that should be the mass of the atom. But that is not the case. The sum of the masses of the constituents is actually greater than the atom's actual mass. Okay. So, it turns out, let us take the example, right. So, this difference is called as a mass defect. So, there is a difference between the sum of mass of the constituent particles and the actual mass of the atom. These two are different and this is called as the mass defect. So, let us take, I mean, because uh, you know uh, carbon 12. So, 1 twelfth of carbon mass is your atomic mass unit, right. But actual, right, that is your atom's actual mass. But what is the mass if you calculate based on the constituents? So, you have 6 mass of protons plus 6 mass of electrons plus 6 mass of neutrons. If you add that, you are actually getting 12.098934 AMUs. Oh, this is clearly different from 12 AMU, right. So, there is a fraction, there is a small difference. This is called as your mass defect. So, what does this indicate? Where does this extra mass, right? Actual mass is only 12, but when you add all this, it comes to this, this much. 
and we are talking about this ex excess mass and we loosely said there has to be something to do with energy states. So, how do we connect the mass and energy? Oh, we know that, right? E is equal to mc square. So, we can connect mass and energy using the equation, famous equation E equal to mc square. Therefore, this mass defect, right? This mass, extra mass accounts for missing energy, which is called as, which called as the binding energy. So, when it is binding, right, it has shed this extra energy. You can look at it that way, right. So, when it is intact, right, together, that is how we talked about even electrons. When, when the electron was part of the atom, it was at low energy, correct. You have to supply energy to bring free the electron. So, when it came back in, it shed the excess energy. Similar concept, right. So, here, the, there is a mass defect. This mass defect has a equivalent energy. That is the one that is binding the constituent particles, right. So, binding energy. So, the relationship between mass and uh, binding energy is from your E is equal to mc square. So, if you take one unit, right, we have always talked about energy in terms of electron volt. That is how we have been defining in this imaging system physics, right. So, when we do that, one units has about 931 million electron volt. So, that means your mass defect is going to correspond to, so your 0 0.09893 whatever, that is a small mass defect, right. That mass defect is going to correspond to 92.1 million. What is this? Oh, that excess energy, that is your binding energy, okay. That is your binding energy. Of course, instead of talking about binding energy, clearly the num heavier the atom, right, more number of uh, constituent particles, probably the, the defect is also going to be little more and therefore, your energy could be more. So, instead of reporting just that, in normalized binding energy per nucleon, okay, per nucleon. So, what is the nucleon here? Oh, you have 12, 6, six protons and 6 neutrons, put together you have 12 particles in the nucleus. So, you have your 92.1 is the energy that is a defect, defect, what mass defect, right, from the mass defect. That energy is your binding energy, binding energy per nucleon, per 12 constituent neutrons plus um, protons is about 7.67. So, essentially you will notice that if right, you will kind of notice a behavior like this with say this is your uh, number of nucleons and this is your binding energy per nucleon, right. So, you will have several elements. So, this is a behavior that this, this depicts, okay. So, it does not really increase or anything. It has an increase and then it kind of plateaus. So, you have a list. In fact, there is a table you can find this plot with exactly which element is lying where, okay. But the, the idea here is nuclear binding energy required to separate P and N, the constituents of your nucleus. So, the radioactivity, right, the radioactive decay can be thought of the process in which you have the radio unstable, right. So, it has to rearrange itself, rearrange itself so that it comes to ground state, inherent lower ground state, okay. So, there is this rearrangement in the nucleus so that you get to a lower energy state. So, if it is unstable, it will become stable by shedding out the excess energy. How does it come down? It rearranges the constituents. So, this nuclear binding energy. So, very equivalent to, I mean analogous, I should say, analogous to the concept of um, electron binding energy that we saw, right. 
So, and then it had to rearrange in the process it gave out the excess. Similar thing happens here, but this is now happening in the nucleus. Okay. So, so we can actually look at now make this, uh, remember I told about uh, this number of uh, protons is approximately number of neutrons and I said we will we'll come, come uh, look at that relationship between neutrons and and uh, protons, right? So, we have two types of nucleates, two groups of nucleates. One is stable, the other is unstable. So, the, uh, the stable is fine. These are considered non-radioactive. We are more interested in the case which is radioactive or rather these are unstable atoms, okay? So, now the question is what kind of atoms so, when we, we talk about unstable atoms which are radioactive, can we talk about their stability? We just talked about their binding energy and number of nucleons, right? Binding energy per nucleon. Is there any clue on what could be unstable, right? So, that is where this concept of line of stability comes in. Line of stability comes into picture. So, here, so before you jump or this line which seems this is not the line of stability. Line of stability is actually this curve that you see. So, what is this? This is a plot between number of protons and number of neutrons, the two constituents of your nucleus. So, now you notice when, when it is a smaller atom, probably this is along the line. But as the size increases, right, as the number of protons increases for the atom, right, they, it becomes a heavier element, you are actually, number of neutrons should be slightly more than your number of protons, so as to be stable. So, these are stable nucleides. So, it is not, even though it is called as line of stability, line of stability is not a line, right. Line of stability is basically telling if uh, how much more neutron should I have for a given proton so that this nuclide is stable. So, in some sense this is the line z equal to n. Here you are talking about stable means it is actually having more neutrons than protons as you as you increase the uh, mass number. Okay. So, um, this is a very important concept because uh, as you uh, will see the whole idea about you can now start to think about uh, radioactivity as nothing but right the stability or instability that you can start to think about in terms of the atom wanting to rearrange the neutron to proton. So, if I am here for example, right, I am unstable. I may want to have right protons, so I may want to convert some proton some way, rearrange so that I want to get to this line to become stable. Right? So I have to increase the neutron, decrease the proton, right, to, to reach this line. So, how this rearrangement takes place, it, we will we'll talk about that. But the idea is this line of stability is important because that tells you when an atom is. So, you can think about radioactivity as the process by which the atom tries to abide by this line of stability. It rearranges so that it forms on this line. So, that is your line of stability. Now, we need to talk more about, we talked about radioactivity, decay, it is trying to rearrange itself, very, very loose terms. So, we will now use the, the next few minutes to organize our thoughts into terminologies that will be consistently used. So, radioactive decay. What is a radioactive decay? It is the rearrangement of the nuclei to low energy state. So, we will have what is called as a parent atom. Parent atom is a 
radioactive unstable atom what will happen it will shed the energy and come give out daughter atom right the daughter atom is supposed to be more stable or in other words you can also view it as daughter atom has higher energy higher binding energy per nucleon higher binding energy per nucleon remember the other cons binding energy per nucleon we we talked about right so that again you can also view it like that so if you have more binding energy per nucleon then it tends to be at a less energy state right so you can also view it in terms of binding energy per nucleon so daughter atom has higher binding energy per nucleon and therefore it is more stable okay so becomes more stable so it so when the parent atom decays you get daughter atom and the daughter atom is more stable so meaning you can think about it as having higher binding energy per nucleon okay so this rearrangement takes place so naturally that means in this rearrangement energy is released right so when we talk about this radioactive decay we talk about some disintegration takes place right so you have this atom atom parent atom becoming daughter atom that means this atom is disintegrated to while it is giving that energy out during the radioactive decay okay so we can think about it in terms of or radioactivity in terms of number of disintegrations per second okay so radioactivity when you say it happens what is happening oh this parent atom is giving daughter atom so it is disintegrating how many disintegrations per second happens that talks about your radioactivity how active right number of disintegrations per second so radioactivity number of disintegrations per second is there any units the si unit is one becquerel or equal to one disintegrations per second or more commonly what is used is curie right so naturally these two are related right one curie is 3.7 into 10 power 10 becquerel what is this curie and becquerel oh these are all named after doyens right people who actually did contribute to these concepts so becquerel and curie are in honor of right people who contributed naturally occurring radioisotope radioisotope was discovered by becquerel artificial radioisotope was produced by curie so the units of this disintegration right si unit is honored with the uh, becquerel but more commonly the dosage that we are using right we tend to use millicurie curie millicurie especially in in bioimaging we are talking you know you, most commonly in terms of curie both are heavy eaters who who contributed to this okay so that is your radioactivity okay fine so now we slowly are getting into the nitty gritty so we got the radioactivity we know this energy shedding um so we have some names right we have some units so uh what do we need to i mean before we jump in completely what is the idea here so you give some radioactivity right we talked about giving a uh, unstable so now you know so you so you're going to give some radioactive tracer into the body and the radioactivity is happening that means disintegrations per second is happening that means while it is disintegrating it is giving excess energy out so what is the intensity uh, so this energy comes out and you want to detect it so what is the intensity of radiation incident on the detector so let's say if the detector is kept at some r distance from your radioactive source same concept we used right you have a source you have a detector how much will be right what will happen is there any law that comes into your mind ah 
exposure right when we talked about what did we say oh stay away every distance you have safety of 1 by d square inverse square law so here also the same thing holds good but uh, what is your uh, intensity or oh, intensity has to do with number in, in our previous uh, x-ray when we covered what did we say or oh, number of photons into number of energy per photon energy per photon here activity gives rise right so number of activity times energy per activity so number radioactivity right number of disintegrations so each disintegration it is giving some h mu out that is your energy so this is your inverse square law 4 pi r square remember so this is the intensity that will fall on the detector when you have r distance due to radioactivity okay of course a is your radioactivity of the material so now you see the problem the problem is i can give okay i have some radiochemist background i am putting some radioactivity i have you saw all the laws how to make it radioactive how to make it unstable so that it becomes it will it will give radioactivity so you are a radiochemist you know how to work with it you engineer a compound engineer an atom you give it then it gives out energy so now the task is how do i detect this and say where it came from okay these are the the important aspects so you know how to measure radioactivity that is the goal right so i know the intensity so if i know my intensity if i know my distance if i know my energy if i know i mean what you, you, you see this is very important what is it that we need to know from here what is the known what is the unknown so this you are going to measure radioactivity and energy per so we need to still go into details to see how what decay happens what is the energy that is coming out this we need to understand of course this r comes into business when we do the geometry right when how where do we place the detector instrumentation and then perhaps from there we can talk about where the source is located okay so we'll get to that clear so we need to measure this radioactivity so let's talk about when you measure radioactivity right when we did this for x rays what did we do we sent an x ray we detected the x ray what happened to the x ray oh it got attenuated along the material and so we used that is our information how much of attenuation happened through the material or the material property was characterized in terms of its ability to attenuate the x ray energy so the mu was the material property that we were going after here what is the problem i am not actually going after the material property of the tissue all i am interested is i have engineered this radioactive material i have put it in i want to know when you put it into the body where is this radioactivity coming from so when i put it into the body it will go through the body it will distribute itself and it will perhaps go to locations where it is going to be involved and the radioactivity is going to come from there so my objective here is to detect the radioactivity is coming from where how much of radioactivity is coming from which location that is my i'm not really interested in the attenuation property of my tissue clear so here what you want so the there why i said that is you had your mu your attenuation we came up with a fundamental attenuation law which was exploited now here attenuation is not the big, uh, deal here there is a fundamental what is that we are interested we are interested in the radioactive decay that is what we are interested so there is a fundamental radioactive decay law that we need to uh, you know put in put here so that that can be exploited for imaging so what does that state that says okay you have you you start with says the num n number of radioactive atoms at any given time right what is radioactivity or oh, disintegrations per time so it's your a of t is your radioactivity is proportional to number of radioactive atoms that are there at that time okay so you can write a 
your radioactivity, I mean just pretend the denseness continues, okay. So, you have rate of change, so your radioactivity is number of disintegrations, right. So, in time how much atom number of atoms change. So, A is equal to minus d n by d t, right, is equal to your lambda n. So, lambda is your d k constant, okay. So, if this is the case, then we can quickly look at it and rewrite, right. What do we want? We want, uh, what are we looking at? Oh, we are looking at when we did the um, x-rays, right, x-ray energy. We were looking at how much we sent, how much came out after it crossed the material. Here, we have a radioactivity and we have some time. So, after some time, how much of radioactivity is left, is happening, okay. So, because you send the radioactivity in, you give it some time, it goes, redistributes itself. After that, radioactive decay is happening and you are detecting it. So, you are interested in the decay, how, you know, the decay rate, how do you capture it over time, okay. So, from here, we can talk about n of t is n naught. So, this is from your boundary condition, whatever at t equal to 0 when you started, whatever was there, right. Number of activity is e power minus. So, here also you talk about say exponential decay, that is what is happening. So, the radioactivity is happening so that you have a exponential decay model. So, your A of t is activity you start with at t equal to 0, right, and then it decays with a constant lambda, and therefore you can have A of t equal to whatever you start lambda n naught e power minus lambda t, clear. So, this means uh, you start with some activity, it starts to decay, this is exponential, so it is never going to go to 0. There is some radioactivity that is going to be always there, right? It is never going to go to 0, but it will become insignificant after some time, right? And that depends on your, your lambda. What is the time depends on your lambda. That is the inherent property of that atom, okay? So, the number of photons generated during this time, what is the number of photons that are generated? Oh, it is decaying and it is sending out, right. So, number of photons generated is going to be number of disintegrations that has happened, right. So, how much is it going to be? Ah, observe some time, radioactivity is number of disintegrations per second. So, I want to see number of disintegrations over T, just integrate the activity over time, right. So, you integrate the activity, you integrate the activity over the given time which you call as the number of photons that are generated, clear. So, you have some photons n0 at t equal to 0, radioactivity, this is radioactive atoms, 1 minus e power minus lambda t. So, n0 minus n0 t power minus lambda t is your leftover. So, the number of photons that are generated, which is equal to your number of disintegrations, clear. So, um, fine. So, this is actually a good place to just quickly think about one concept. So, when you talk about uh, starting point and right after some time this much radioactivity has happened. When we talked about the analogous concept when we did x-ray imaging, when we talked about number of photons that go in fundamental attenuation law e power minus mu delta x and what comes out. We talked about an important metric as, okay, how much is the material, how much the material, so we talked about mu as a material property. Here we are talking about radioactivity as the property and we have this fundamental law. So, natural quantity of interest is, oh, when is it 50 percent? There we talked about half value layer thickness when the attenuation was 50 percent. 
here likewise you start with some n not some radioactivity when does it become half right that is a quantity of interest so half life half life is the time it takes for the radioactivity to decrease by half okay so same concept how do we do oh, we start with the previous equation right we need t half t half is nothing but you start with some a0 when does it become half a t half so ratio is equal to 1 by 2 e power minus lambda t half so essentially it depends on the material property right there we talked about half value layer thickness when we talked about we talked about inherent material property was the mu here radioactivity okay so this again has similar workings right so you have a half you have a e so we could do this ln and we can get the value so t half is 0.693 by lambda as a formulation as a formulation this looks exactly same i should say similar just because he instead of lambda we had mu okay instead of lambda we had a mu whereas here it is lambda otherwise the quantity of interest is half life there it was half value layer so this half value both are exponential models okay so what does this signify so this signifies again this lambda is the constant radioactive decay constant of that material radioactive atom so the atoms change their radioactive decay some can decay very fast some can decay slow so now you see the the issue so you can send some material which is radioactive that material what is that material property of interest to us is the depending on its decay rate right it is going to give so many it is going to decay at certain rate which is going to give you number of photons that are coming out at that rate at certain energy and you have to capture that and say so you cannot want the so we'll talk about the importance of this parameter right when we when we get slightly ahead so the ideal characteristics or what do you want of this parameter see the idea is mu we couldn't really change much because it was inherent distribution of course there also we did change we sent a contrast agent that was finely tuned here you are actually engineering it and sending it so you have little more uh, leverage okay so as long as we understand what this is we can also ask discuss about the desirable properties of a atom say what should be a good value for lambda and that maybe we can send it okay so we'll stop right here what we will do next is we will understand we said dk dk but we didn't really go into the details how is it what are the modes of dk what are the different types of dk that are possible what are the energy levels that are coming right these are we just said dk energy level comes out but we need to be little more specific on that so we need to talk about modes of dk what are the energy that comes out and then uh, similar to previous uh, x ray photons right you have to talk about energies that are coming out energy packets that are coming out so when this dk happens what energy comes out is there any probability randomness in that okay and uh, and after that you really think about the photon energy the interaction with the body is not much we have already covered that when we talked about x ray photon it's just that it's going to be of higher energy as you will see uh, so that will be for the the physics so we'll we'll continue uh, on the modes of decay right after this thank you